They tell us these are hoaxes, mistakes, the stuff of legends, but some discoveries are too dangerous, too paradigm-shattering to be revealed. Suppressed by governments, ridiculed by mainstream science, these objects hint at an astonishing truth. We are not alone. Witness the groundbreaking evidence they're desperately trying to hide. Uncover the secrets that suggest an alien presence closer than you ever dared believe. All right, I'm gonna start off the list with a very recent discovery. This is actually pretty nuts, very exciting. So the South Carolina Ocean Exploration Company captured a sonar image in the Pacific Ocean that they say seems to be a Lockheed 10E Electra aircraft, the same one Amelia Earhart flew. It was spotted 16,000 feet underwater. It was also about 100 miles away from Howland Island, which was going to be her next stop, along with navigator Fred Noonan. Now, if this is actually Earhart's plane, this would be the answer to a decades-old mystery, but a sad answer. It would mean she didn't vanish or disappear to start a new life somewhere. It would mean she just crashed and died. But it could also bring closure to the whole case, and at the end of the day, her legacy would still live on. It wouldn't change all the accomplishments she made. But let's talk about some other strange stuff that points to the theory that maybe Earhart did survive. All right, so after Amelia Earhart disappeared, there were reports of her sending out SOS signals and radio messages, as if she were in trouble trying to get help. Now, these distress signals and radio transmissions weren't just heard one time, they kept coming in after she had apparently vanished, as if she was still out there somewhere trying to reach someone. The idea here is that she likely did crash, but might have survived the initial crash and was doing her best to reach out for help. Now again, the implications for this one are kind of dark, just because she may have survived the initial crash, uh, but that doesn't mean she survived, you know? But this next point is a little more uplifting. Sightings of Amelia Earhart and Fred Noonan. Yeah, people have claimed to see these two alive over the years. Numerous individuals claim to have seen her and Fred Noonan alive in various locations. This would point to the theory that Earhart intentionally disappeared in order to start a new life. Something that a lot of people really hoped was the case, but many argue that these sightings are really just wishful thinking, tricking people's minds into misidentifying them. And I mean, they may not have even believed what they were saying, it could just be attention seeking. This isn't something that's exclusive to Amelia Earhart. Tons of public figures and celebrities and musicians that died before their time have conspiracies like this surrounding them. You know, Tupac's not dead. I saw him just last week. You know, Kurt Cobain, same deal. People who are inspired by these folks just don't want to believe that they truly are gone. The fact is, Earhart was never found. So she could have survived and started living out of the public eye. You know, it's possible. Again, we have a darker discovery here, bones. In 1939, several bones were found on Nekamuraro, a remote Pacific island. In 1998, documents from the British Western Pacific High Commission revealed that a work crew of islanders discovered a skull and bones in Gardner Island in 1939. The British suspected that these might be Earhart's remains and shipped them to Dr. D.W. Hoodless in Suva, Fiji for identification. Now at the time the bones were not believed to be connected with Earhart at all, as they were male bones, but it turns out they were wrong, at least about the bones being male. Decades later, Rick Gillespie sent the measurements recorded by her list to forensic anthropologist Karen Burns at the University of North Carolina. She took the bone measurements and used modern forensic technology, comparing them to estimations of Earhart's bone measurements based on photos of her and her clothing. What she found was that these bones had definitely belonged to a female, and that Earhart was actually a very likely match. The problem is, they didn't have the actual bones to work with, uh, just the measurements. The bones themselves have been lost to time. Again, again, they ruled them out belonging to Amelia Earhart at the time, so they didn't really care about them. If these bones were still around, scientists would have been able to do actual DNA testing on them. So we're not 100% sure if these bones belong to her. If these were her remains, though, it means she may have survived a crash and ended up on the island, possibly surviving for at least some time. That's gonna bring us to another discovery on that exact same island. Part of a shoe. 
A shoe part was discovered on the same island, an uninhabited island about a thousand miles north of Fiji. The International Group for Historic Aircraft Recovery, or the T-I-G-H-A-R, that really rolls off the tongue, led by Rick Gillespie, found a black rubber shoe heel with, with an indentation stamped with Cat's Paw Rubber Company USA. Gillespie suspected that this could be a part of Earhart's footwear. The discovery in 1991 also included aluminum airplane parts and plexiglass. Gillespie, believing that the heel and partial sole might have belonged to Earhart, held a press conference, but experts uh, questioned the evidence as the shoe size indicated by the heel was a size nine, seemingly too large for Earhart. Gillespie organized another expedition in 1996. He didn't uncover much except stories from nearby islanders about two skeletons found in the late 30s on the island, then called Garner Island, as we discussed before. Next up, we have the photo. So in 2017, a very interesting photo surfaced, a photo that experts like Sean Henry, the former executive assistant director for the FBI, have assessed and said it has not been doctored or tampered with. This photo, which was found in the National Archives and taken in 1937 on the Marshall Islands, seems to show a woman resembling Amelia Earhart and a man believed to be Fred Noonan standing on a dock. Earhart's last communication was on July 2nd of 1937, and she was declared dead two years later, presumed to have crashed in the Pacific Ocean. But if this really is Earhart in this photo, uh, she survived. The woman in the picture is short-haired, wearing pants, a, char a characteristic choice of Earhart. And also, there is a man resembling Noonan. The guy in the picture has Noonan's same distinctive receding hairline, and the nose looks a little similar. There's also a Japanese ship, a Koshu, in the picture, towing a barge that's a similar length to Earhart's plane. And this is going to lead us into our next point. There's another theory that Earhart was captured. Locals have stories about witnessing Earhart's crash and reported seeing her in captivity. Some believe the Koshu transported her to Saipan, to Saipan and the to Saipan in the Mariana Islands, where she may have died under Japanese custody. But Japanese authorities deny having any record of Earhart being in their custody. So the idea here is that Earhart and Noonan survived their crash and were then taken into Japanese custody. The investigative team behind the discovery pointed to the photograph, which was marked Jaluit et al. and dated 1937 and might have been taken by a U.S. spy monitoring Japanese military activity in the Pacific. Now, this one I'm a little skeptical about. Like, why would they have been taken into custody? Plus, they don't look all that distressed in the photo. But that does lead us to another theory. Why might she have been taken into Japanese custody? Well, another theory is that Amelia Earhart was actually a spy. Yeah, she wasn't just a pilot on a daring trek across the world. She was working for the U.S. government. But what was her mission, you're probably asking? Well, this conspiracy theory is that Earhart had been tasked with documenting and spying on Japanese island installations. But when the Japanese spotted Earhart and Noonan, they either shot them down or forced them to land, where they were then taken into custody. It does connect the dots in the whole photograph thing, uh, but I don't know. This one seems a little outlandish to me, but uh, what do you all think? So if Earhart was taken into Japanese custody, did she die? Well, that's one possibility. Another is that she escaped or was rescued. This would be a pretty good explanation for the new identity conspiracy theory that's pretty famous. If Earhart had been in fear of any further re repercussions, she may have been advised to take on a new identity. So in 1970, a book came out called Amelia Earhart Lives, written by Joe Class. In the book, Class proposes that Earhart was rescued from capture and was sent to New Jersey, almost like a witness protection program type situation, where she changed her name to Irene Bolum, a uh, banker. And uh, you know what, I can kind of see the resemblance. I can see her being an older Earhart. Irene Bolum did not approve of the book though. She filed a lawsuit against the publisher denying the claims made in the book, and the book ended up being uh, taken off of shelves. Kind of crazy. Uh, how some guy seemed to just decide, you know what, I'm gonna, I'm gonna write a book 
about this woman and uh, because she kind of looks like Amelia Earhart and I'm just gonna say that she is. Uh, you know what? <laughs> Who knows though, maybe Bolum really was Earhart and this guy somehow knew about it and uh, she just needed to keep her true identity secret. Um, I, I kind of doubt it though. And the final aspect of the Amelia Earhart mystery is the discovery of wreckage that some researchers have said bears a serious resemblance to her plane. Over the years, there have been sonar images, aside from the most recent one we discussed at the top, and alleged sightings of underwater wreckage that some believe could be Earhart's Lockheed Electra. Some have looked at this wreckage and said it aligns with the known flight path and the disappearance coordinates of her aircraft. I really hope though that this recent discovery sheds more light on this case. I imagine they're gonna send a team down to look at the wreckage, if it really is the wreckage of a plane. For now, we'll just have to cross our fingers and wait. But now it's time for a comment shout out. This one was posted to my top 10 abandoned places in California. You are banned from visiting list. John Dunn 6756 writes, I work in the town of Mount Shasta. This was just about the most accurate description of what some people believe that I've heard from someone who doesn't live there. There have been supposed Bigfoot sightings on the mountain and one store owner, I won't give the name of the store to protect the owner's claims, that once a month he opens the store at midnight so a group of Lemarians can come in private to purchase goods. Many of the people who live in the town are, well, a little nuts. Some people literally worship the mountain as a deity and others refuse to set foot in the mountain because they are not worthy and the mountain will cause them harm. First on our list today we have the discovery and revival of an ancient virus freed from the Antarctic permafrost after 48,500 years. Oh my gosh, have we learned nothing from sci-fi and television. You do not restore ancient viruses. You don't do it. Well, they did it. The zombie virus was discovered as a result of melting ice in the Antarctic region after laying dormant for tens of thousands of years. And honestly, scientists believe that while the risks are low, much like your ex, it does raise red flags as a potential endangerment to human health. The virus was returned to its former infectious glory in a lab after being inserted with cultured cells. Luckily for us, as of yet, scientists have only attempted to reanimate viruses that target single cell amoebas, not humans or animals. That's great and all, but it still seems like pretty risky business to me. The scientist who performed the reanimation maintains he has done so to shed light on the potential risk of more dangerous viruses' ability to resurface and affect humans should the Antarctic permafrost continue to melt. Not only that, but as the ice continues to thaw, it also has the potential to release chemical and radioactive waste into our ecosystems. So think about that. Next up, we have the discovery of a hidden landmass frozen in time and ice and estimated to be bigger than Belgium. The landscape consists of hills and valleys believed to have been carved by ancient rivers over millions of years ago. Its existence was confirmed using a technique called radio echo sounding, which uses sound waves to determine distances based off of which corresponding maps of underground structures and landscapes can be created. Without even laying eyes on an area, we are able to determine the heights of its peaks and the depths of its deepest points. The area of land stretching 32,000 square kilometers, 12,000 square miles, is a scientific marvel as scientists believe its climate and geology to have been massively different from that of modern day Antarctica. Which of course brings me to my next point. Also discovered within the ice and hidden beneath the frozen desert were the remains of an estimated 90 million year old subtropical rainforest. Scientists were so excited when deep beneath the ice they discovered an incredibly well-preserved network of root systems within a sediment core sample. A sediment core sample is basically like a ground extraction that shows all the layers of sediment that have settled over the last, I guess in this case, 90 million years. Not only did they find root systems, but the soil was so well preserved that they were also able to find traces of pollen, spores, and the remains of flowering plants. Based on these findings, it was concluded that the coast of West Antarctica at one point in time contained a thick, swampy rainforest which was home to a large variety of plant and animal species. Scientists also concluded weather patterns of heavy rainfall and heightened levels of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. 
Next on the list we have BLOOD Falls. I apologize for having to spell it out for you. I don't think I'm allowed to say that word on here, but just by the look, I'm sure you can guess where the name comes from. So let's talk about the color. If you want to guess how it happens, I'll give you a moment. Maybe pause the video, head to the comments, lock in your answer. You done? Okay, the answer is iron, but not in the way you think. The red waters are rich in iron, but they don't actually turn red until they come into contact with the air. Well, maybe you did think that, but let me explain further. It's actually a mix of iron oxides and hydroxides along with high salt content in the water, chlorine and magnesium that give the river flow its yellow, orange and reddish coloring rather than the classic like murky brown we would usually see coming out of eroded sink faucets. Super creepy, but again, super cool. Next up, we have the discovery of ancient bacteria like nothing we've ever seen on Earth before. Like it's so strange, scientists wonder if it might possibly have come from like outer space. Perhaps a passenger on an ancient asteroid that arrived on Earth millions of years ago. And why do they think that? Well, because generally bacteria has a minimum requirement of six things it needs in order to survive, and those things are food, acidity, time, generally a warm temperature, oxygen, and moisture. But this bacteria just needs air, making it an absolute scientific anomaly and a massive discovery that moves us forward in our understanding of the way in which extraterrestrial organisms might be able to survive on other planets and in space. What do you guys think? As we move past our halfway point, let's go beneath the ice all the way down to the Antarctic seafloor where the once lost ship Endurance was discovered in impeccable condition, preserved by the country's icy waters. For a long time, the Endurance shipwreck remained one of the greatest undiscovered mysteries, but that all changed in 2022 when, at a depth of 3,008 meters, the vessel was found, and that's 9,868.8 feet. The discovery was made via a combination of helicopters, underwater robots, and other state-of-the-art technology, which allowed it to be remotely filmed and explored. Although the wreck was crushed by ice and sunk over 100 years ago, the ship's name was Although the wreck was crushed by ice and sunk over 100 years ago, the ship's name was still clearly legible along the stern of the vessel. And this is an incredible scientific feat as it highlights the extreme advances in technology, allowing us to explore some of the most inhospitable and extreme depths of our oceans. And next up we have a freaky looking lanky underwater insect known as the giant sea spider. While they aren't actually spiders, they are in fact part of the insect family and they are the largest sea spider found anywhere in the world with some showing off a leg span of up to 10 inches. Ooh. These animals belong to a rare group that have no need for a respiratory system, breathing instead through their digestive system. The animal typically feeds off anemones, sea worms, jellyfish, sponges, and soft corals, making it technically carnivorous. And it feeds using a small tube which it inserts into its soft-bodied prey, allowing it to literally suck their guts out. Gross. As for the spider's guts, those are stored in the long, spindly legs of the creature, commonly found in shallow waters surrounding Antarctica. However, they have also been spotted at depths of 7,000 meters, 23,000 feet, making them highly adaptable to changes in both pressure and environment. Next up, we have another relative giant, the giant Antarctic scale worm, which measures in at 20 centimeters, 7.8 inches long, and 10 centimeters, 4 inches wide. Now, that might not seem gigantic to you, but remember, it's a worm, so. Yeah, it's pretty big. And it's also super uncomfortable to look at. Well, from head on, but the underbelly is actually quite cool, looking as though the creature is lined with shiny gold feathers along its edges, which are actually appendages that help it move along rock formations and the sea floor. Its back is covered in scales that act as fully functioning body armor to protect against predators. Back to the head, which is, to put it nicely, unpleasant, and it's not even a head, really, it's just a fully retractable throat. While there is still so much we don't know about this recently discovered creature, the two sharp fangs on both its top and bottom jaw suggest it has a carnivorous diet and hunting rather than scavenging behavior. The animal is known to enjoy depths of up to 1,640 feet, and they're also super good for the underwater ecosystem, assisting in the building of reefs by recycling ocean waste through a process called worm composting where they turn food scraps into other organic material that acts like soil for the seafloor. 
Next up in our top two today, we have Mount Erubus, the world's southernmost fully active volcano that last erupted in 2020 and contains a very elusive lava lake. The lava lake sits within the volcano and it's basically a pool of molten lava that never hardens but instead remains in a constant viscous fluid state. While you might have assumed this kind of thing to exist at the bottom of every active volcano around the world, you'd be incorrect as they are actually incredibly rare because they require an incredible specific set of conditions to be able to form. You see, a volcano's lava is generally held way underground in something called a magma chamber that connects to a volcano through an underground channel in the Earth's crust. And ever so often, under the right conditions, the magma chamber sends lava shooting up through the channel and the crater of the volcano into the atmosphere. A lava lake is different. It exists above ground within the crater of a volcano. And the bottom of the lake is connected to the magma chamber by a much shorter passageway called a conduit, which is basically like a long pipe. The lava from the chamber rises into the lake and when the lava begins to cool, it moves back down towards the chamber to heat and rise once more. Thus, the lake remains unfrozen and in constant flow. Also a pretty cool sight to see. And finally, last on the list, we have ancient skulls, or at least that's what they kind of look like. These elongated skulls were allegedly found in 2016 by a team of archaeologists working in Antarctica. The discovery was shocking, and the bones dated all the way back to 1820. And it was originally believed that humans had not set foot in Antarctica until hundreds of years later. Of course, the timeline, along with the appearance of the bones, has led many to speculate that these bones are not belonging to the first humans in Antarctica, but rather the first extraterrestrials on Earth. While scientists are still baffled by the age of the bones, the shape of them didn't come as too much of a surprise to professionals, as the elongated skulls have been discovered in other places around the world and have been attributed to ritualistic physical cultural practices done by certain ancient societies. It has been said, however, that these particular skulls appear to not only be elongated, but much bigger than any to have ever been found before. So. Who knows, maybe aliens aren't such a bad guess after all. Let's start off with the mysterious disappearance of the Anasazi. The ancestral Puebloans, also known as the Anasazi, mysteriously disappeared from the Colorado Plateau around 1300 AD, leaving a baffling historical puzzle behind. This advanced civilization, once thriving in intricate cliff dwellings and known for their remarkable pottery and architectural skills, vanished without a clear explanation. Their sudden disappearance, leaving behind hauntingly empty homes and undisturbed artifacts, has long puzzled scientists and archaeologists. Theories range from severe droughts disrupting their agriculture-based society to internal conflicts or even mass migrations to more hospitable lands. Yet, the absence of definitive evidence leaves us wondering, was their fate a result of natural causes, societal upheaval, or perhaps something more profound and unknown to our current understanding. Moving on to another mystery, this one sits beneath the tranquil waters of Rock Lake, Wisconsin. Here rests a hidden marvel of ancient architecture, a mysterious pyramid believed to be over 10,000 years old. This submerged structure poses baffling questions. How did such a sophisticated construction end up deep underwater? What civilization could have built this mysterious edifice, and for what purpose? Theories range from a lost civilization to unknown natural disasters, yet the dark, silt-laden waters of Rock Lake shroud these secrets in profound mystery, defying clear answers and fueling the imagination with possibilities of a forgotten chapter in human history. Taking it back to 1945, Flight 19, a squadron of five TBM Avenger torpedo bombers, mysteriously vanished over the Bermuda Triangle during a routine trip. Training flight. The flight's leader, Lieutenant Charles Taylor, was heard over the radio with a final, very ominous message. Quote, we are entering white water. Nothing seems right. This cryptic transmission was the last known contact with the flight. An extensive search operation was launched, but neither the planes nor the crew members were ever found, adding to the lore of the Bermuda Triangle. The disappearance of Flight 19 remains one of the most famous aviation mysteries. The experienced pilots, well-trained and familiar with their route, inexplicably 
actually deviated from their course. Theories range from spatial disorientation to magnetic anomalies, but the truth remains a mystery. What could have led these skilled airmen into a fatal error, and how did they vanish without a trace in one of the most puzzling regions of the ocean? Moving on, we have the mass graves of Tulsa. In 1921, Tulsa, Oklahoma was the site of one of the most horrific racial massacres in American history, an event often overlooked in historical accounts. Known as the Tulsa Race Massacre, this tragedy resulted in the destruction of the Greenwood District, also known as the Black Wall Street, a prosperous black community. Recent excavations in the area have uncovered mass graves, a chilling testament to the scale of this atrocity. These findings serve as a grim reminder of the violence that was inflicted, with scientists and historians diligently working to identify the victims and reconstruct the events of those very dark days. Efforts are ongoing to bring closure to families and acknowledge a painful chapter in American history that has long been neglected. Moving on to Hexham, North America, where the discovery of two ancient stone heads in a garden led to a series of chilling events that baffled both locals and experts. These heads, believed to be of Celtic origin, were soon linked to unusual and terrifying occurrences, most notably sightings of a werewolf-like creature prowling the area. The phenomenon intensified, with reports of eerie noises and inexplicable disturbances in homes near where the heads were found. Strangely, even after the heads were removed from the site, the mysterious happenings persisted. This led to widespread speculation about a possible ancient curse or a supernatural connection, deepening the mystery and leaving more questions than answers in their wake. Moving on at our halfway point, we have the moving stones of Death Valley. At racetrack Playa in Death Valley, a peculiar and haunting spectacle unfolds. Here, heavy stones, some weighing hundreds of pounds, mysteriously glide across the desert floor, etching long trails behind them as if charting their secret journeys. For years, this baffling phenomenon has completely perplexed scientists. Initially, it seemed impossible for such heavy objects to move without human or animal intervention. However, recent theories have brought a semblance of understanding, suggesting a combination of thin ice sheets forming under the rocks, and then strong wind gusts providing just enough force to set these stones in motion. Despite this, the exact mechanism behind this eerie dance of the desert stones remains elusive, continuing to intrigue and also completely mystify those who witness it. The silent, slow-moving journey of these stones across the barren playa represents a captivating natural puzzle, one that beautifully exemplifies the mysteries our planet still holds. In the small town of Falk, Arkansas, a legend lurks in the murky swamps. Residents have whispered and wondered about sightings of a large, ape-like creature known as the Falk Monster or the Southern Sasquatch. Since the 1950s, this creature has been the subject of numerous reports and, of course, local folklore. Described as a foul-smelling, nocturnal, bipedal being, it's said to roam the swampy, dense areas of the region, often shrouded in mystery and darkness. Eyewitness accounts vary, but common descriptions include glowing red eyes, a terrifying growl, and a towering height. Skeptics argue it might be a misidentified or undiscovered animal species, while others speculate about more supernatural origins. Is this creature a real undiscovered animal lurking in the southern wilderness, or a product of mass hysteria among the townsfolk? Or is there a more chilling explanation behind these sightings? You tell me. Moving on, we have the mystery of the Georgia Guidestones. In Elbert County, Georgia stands a monumental structure known as the Georgia Guidestones. Erected in 1980 by an anonymous group, this structure consists of six granite slabs towering over 19 feet high. The stones are inscribed with 10 guidelines in eight modern languages, advocating for concepts like population control, 
control, environmentalism, and world peace. Additionally, there is a shorter message inscribed at the top of this structure in four ancient languages – Babylonian, Classical Greek, Sanskrit, and Egyptian hieroglyphs. The identity of those responsible for its construction and their intentions remains a complete mystery. This ambiguity has led to various interpretations and conspiracy theories. Are these stones a guide for post-apocalyptic survival, a manifesto from a secretive group seeking a new world order, or perhaps a philosophical statement about humanity's future? Down in Florida, there is a remarkable structure known as the Coral Castle. Built single-handedly by the Latvian immigrant Edward Lietzkalin from 1923 to 1951, this stone structure is composed of over 1,000 tons of oolitic limestone, with each megalithic stone weighing several tons. What makes this feat even more incredible is that Lietzkalin stood just over 5 feet tall and weighed barely 100 pounds, yet he managed to construct the entire complex alone under the cover of night using only primitive tools. He claimed to have unlocked the secrets of the ancient Egyptian pyramids, harnessing a unique understanding of magnetism and earth energies to move these colossal stones. The intricacies of his method, like the turning of a 9 ton gate that moves with a touch, remains a mystery. How did one man accomplish such an architectural marvel, and what profound secrets of ancient construction techniques might he have rediscovered? And why the f did he not share that information with the rest of us? That's my question, okay? That's not in the script. That's just greedy. Greedy, greedy, greedy. <laughs> in southwestern Vermont, shrouded in the dense forest of the Green Mountains, lies a mysterious area known as the Bennington Triangle. This region gained notoriety for a series of chilling and unexplained disappearances that occurred between 1945 and 1950. Much like the infamous Bermuda Triangle, the Bennington Triangle seems to have a perplexing history of people vanishing without a trace, sparking a myriad of theories and folklore. Among the the most notable disappearances was that of Paula Jean Weldon in 1946, a case that remains unsolved and continues to haunt the area. Theories range from natural causes and criminal acts to more otherworldly explanations like alien abductions or interdimensional portals. The dense wilderness and rugged terrain add to the mystery, making searches and investigations very challenging. What truly makes the Bennington Triangle so perilous, and what could be behind these mysterious mysterious disappearances. The answers remain as elusive as the victims themselves, buried deep in the silent, watchful woods of Vermont. And we're starting off the list with the Challenger Deep. Imagine taking a journey to the deepest point on Earth. It would be exciting, for sure, but undeniably terrifying at the same time. The Challenger Deep is the deepest known point of the seabed of Earth. This extreme abyss lies at the southern end of the Mariana Trench in the western Pacific Ocean. James Cameron didn't just stick to directing blockbusters, He's a deep sea enthusiast as well. In 2012, he climbed into a specially designed submersible called the Deep Sea Challenger and descended about 36,000 feet, reaching the Challenger Deep, which is deeper than Mount Everest is tall. There's a handful of others who've dared to explore this mysterious abyss. Victor Vescavo, a Texan adventurer and businessman, went deeper in 2019. His submersible, the limiting factor, touched the ocean floor at a whopping 36 1070 feet, breaking records. So right, it's deep, but what's down there? All sorts of weird and wonderful creatures, and some of them have never been seen anywhere else on Earth. Deep sea divers have also discovered microorganisms that thrive in the extreme conditions of the deep where sunlight can't penetrate. They survive in total darkness and under intense pressure. Organisms like this are pretty cool to discover, too, because it makes us really question what the true limit of life are, and the potential for extraterrestrial life in the universe that may thrive in environments we've never thought living matter could. Number 9. Humanoid Creatures So the year is 1982, and Russian military divers are conducting routine training exercises in the deep, dark waters of Lake Baikal, the world's deepest freshwater lake. These divers reported encountering something they couldn't wrap their heads around. Humanoid Creatures. Survivors stated the beings were about 9 feet tall with humanoid features and silvery scales or suits 
covering their bodies. Some even say they had large, unblinking eyes that emitted an eerie glow. Now, the official stance is predictably hush hush. The Soviet government supposedly classified any information related to this incident, which, of course, just turned cryptid and UFO enthusiast cranks even more. What makes a possible extraterrestrial or mythical creature sighting more plausible? Then a government cover up. And at number eight, we have a story posted to Reddit by user Digestives Rule. This was in response to a thread asking divers what the creepiest thing they'd experienced while diving was. Digestives Rule wrote I'm a commercial diver and was once on a job cleaning a portable water reservoir. I'd been in other reservoirs before, but this one was by far the biggest at 40 by 80 meters. To get in, you had to open a hatch in the ground. The whole reservoir was underground and climbed down a ladder. The hatch was in a corner, so when you were in the far corner of the reservoir, it was completely pitch black and you just had to hope your light didn't go out. I was about halfway through a three hour dive when the batteries in my torch started going flat. I watched the beam get narrower and dimmer until it cut out completely. It's not a huge problem if you lose light as you can just follow your umbilical back to the hatch. Just as I started walking back, some obnoxiously loud banging started somewhere in the reservoir. I was the only diver in there, so it both confused and scared the out of me. Needless to say, I ran back to the hatch as fast as I could. I ended up getting my torch changed out and doing another hour in the water, but I didn't hear the noise again. I still have no idea what it was, but the combination of my torch going out and loud banging coming from somewhere gave me a hell of a fright. Now let us turn our attention to the elusive giant squid. So for the longest time, these colossal creatures were thought of in the same way the Loch Ness Monster is. Simply rumored to exist, but rarely seen and often dismissed as seafaring folklore. The big breakthrough in the giant squid saga came in 2004, when researchers and a Japanese film crew managed to capture the first images of a living giant squid in its natural habitat. I cannot imagine the excitement. They basically stumbled on a real-life sea monster. The series of images were a game changer, proving that these creatures weren't just the stuff of sailors' tall tales. Then in 2012, another significant moment occurred when scientists managed to capture giant squid footage for the first time in its natural habitat. This time, submersibles were used to spot the creatures. So what makes giant squids so fascinating other than how elusive they are? Well, they're colossal. Some individuals can reach lengths of up to 43 feet with eyes the size of basketballs. Speaking of giant stuff, let's talk a bit about giant isopods. The giant isopod is a crustacean that inhabits the Mariana Trench and other deep sea environments. They kind of look like an oversized pill bug. These things can reach lengths of over 16 inches. Thank God these things were designated for deep sea environments. I've always thought potato bugs are actually kind of cute, but they would not be cute if they were 16 inches long. Don't have the uh, time for that kind of thing scuttling around my apartment. Giant isopods are scavengers feeding on the remains of dead animals that sink to the trench floor. Their slow metabolism allows them to survive on limited food resources in the deep sea environment. Next up on the list, we have underwater pyramids in Cuba. There is a lot of controversy surrounding the so-called underwater pyramids off the coast of Cuba. Discovered by oceanographer Pauline Zalitsky and her husband Paul Weinswig in 2000, these structures lie at a depth of around 2,000 feet. So when images of this underwater site were first released, people looked at them and were like, that looks like some kind of underwater pyramid or something. Are these structures that maybe are part of some ancient lost civilization? The mysterious alignment of the structures has also led some to propose extraterrestrial involvement. The idea that maybe these pyramids could be part of an ancient alien civilization's underwater base. Just like with many cases of this kind, some also claim that governments and mainstream archaeologists are suppressing information about the site to maintain the status quo. And on the other end of the spectrum, you have, of course, these skeptics. They basically just said, these are natural formations, and what folks are seeing is just a case of pareidolia. While many remain skeptical about the existence of an advanced ancient civilization beneath the waves, looking at these images, you really can't deny how on 
uncanny some of these formations look. And number four, we have Bimini Road. Bimini Road discovered off the coast of North Bimini Island in the Bahamas in 1968 has, again, a lot of controversy surrounding it. It consists of a series of rectangular limestone blocks arranged in a linear pattern, looking almost like a road. The discovery was first made by pilots flying over the area, and then underwater expeditions confirmed the existence of the submerged structure. Now, according to mainstream scientists, Bimini Road consists of beach rock, a result of sand and shell fragments cementing over time. So many of them believe it isn't man-made, but there are more interesting theories. Some propose an Atlantis connection, that maybe the structure is a remnant of the mythical lost city. There's just too many straight lines and right angles in the formation for it to be some natural occurrence. And there are theories not linked with Atlantis, the possibility of some other advanced prehistoric civilization predating the known cultures. And because the internet exists and there are people with all kinds of crazy ideas all over the globe, there are even more outlandish theories about this formation, some claiming technological anomalies associated with the stones, like unusual magnetic fields and unexplained energy readings. All right, back to some mysterious creature stuff though, the yellow belly sea monster. On September 11th of 1876, Captain John K. Webster and James Anderson aboard the Nestor saw something they'd truly never forget. It was an unidentified sea creature while off the coast of Malaysia. They described the thing as about 60 to 100 feet in length. It looked a bit like a large tadpole with a flat necklace head. It didn't seem to have any fins or flippers either, and its yellow skin had a prominent black stripe running along its spine. About nine years later, on October 4th of 1885, a similar creature was observed in South Africa. Witnesses reported a 90-foot creature with yellow skin, black stripes, but this creature had fins on either side. In 1965, Bernard Havelmans, a Belgian-French scientist, explorer, researcher, also often referred to as the father of cryptozoology, looked at these two sightings and then categorized the creature as the yellow belly. He believed it could be an unknown shark species or possibly an amphibian, creating a classification for tadpole-like sea monsters on a bigger scale. Course. The most famous yellow belly sighting, though, occurred on December 12th of 1964 near Hook Island, Queensland. Robert Lasaric and his family, along with a friend, spotted an 80 foot creature in the shallow water. At first, they thought it was dead because of a visible wound, but it opened its mouth and began swimming towards their boat. The creature had smooth, dark skin with brown stripes, no visible fins or teeth, and slit shaped pupils. Then the family just got out of there. At number two, we have the underwater Stonehenge. Off the shores of Lake Michigan lies an intriguing underwater discovery known as the underwater Stonehenge. Researchers came across the site while using sonar technology to explore the lake's floor. The underwater formation features a cluster of stones arranged in a circular or horseshoe type pattern, looking a lot like the renowned Stonehenge in England. In terms of the mainstream scientific world, experts propose that the stones may be natural geological formations that always seems uh, to be their go-to. People will be like, ah, oh, look at this. And then they're like, ah, eh, it's just, it's natural, it's natural. While others think that this site might hold evidence of an ancient civilization predating recorded history. The stones seem to be placed in this very precise alignment. And of course, Atlantis always comes into the conversation. Finally though, we have another story posted to Reddit. This one by user Tamu. Actually, we have two short stories here. They go as follows. This isn't my story, but my dad's. So when he was in grad school, he did some field studies classes, some of which involved diving in Monterey Bay. One day he was diving, counting something off the Santa Cruz Pier, and he finds a shopping cart with bricks and cinder blocks and a chain attached to the handle. He naturally followed the chain and found a bare foot wrapped in the chain. He assumes something probably ate the rest of the body, and apparently his friends had seen similar things too. Also not mine, but my dad's friend. He says he was on a shelf counting mussels when he felt something tap his tank. He looked around, didn't see anything. He figured it was a seal, because they like to play. When he was nudged, 
again, he saw it was a great white. He says he thought to himself, if it gets me, it gets me. I can't outswim it. Now, I don't know if he was actually that chill. I sure wouldn't be, but that's how he tells it. So that second story really gets me. Like the foot is super creepy, but turning around to see a great white right next to you and you're in its habitat and you just have that acceptance of like, there's nothing I can do in this situation. That is fear on like a true primal level. Yeah, spooky. And we're starting things off with the discovery of possibly the oldest art in the world. Now the common belief is that Homo sapiens were the first human species to create art. But a finding in 2014 showed that that may not have been the case at all. Archeologists may have found ancient art created by not our species, but by our distant ancestor, Homo erectus. Previously, we thought that the earliest evidence of sophisticated art dated back around 70 to 100,000 years ago, crafted by Homo sapiens. But in 2014, a shell engraved with geometric patterns was discovered in a riverbank in Indonesia. It was dated to be at least 430,000 years old and believed to have been made by Homo erectus. So Homo erectus was never thought to have been artistic in any way. Now, am I saying the art on this shell was like a breathtaking piece? No, I mean, it's zigzags etched into a shell, but it's pretty cool that this may have been created by an extinct species of human. This pushes back the timeline for complex cognitive abilities much further than we thought before. And it changes the idea that modern human behavior, in this case, artistic expression and abstract thought just suddenly came about in a burst of evolutionary innovation around 100 to 200,000 years ago. Instead, it looks like some of what we consider modern may have been around in our ancestors ancestors hundreds of thousands of years earlier. And speaking of extinct human species, there are also recent findings that point to Homo naledi possibly being more intelligent than we thought and doing stuff like burying their dead. Originally discovered in a South African cave system, these 300,000 year old hominins were thought to have had a mix of human and pre-human features, but not much else. But Recent evidence points to them having possibly been way more complex than we thought before. There's evidence that Homo naledi may have intentionally buried their dead. The idea has always been that only modern humans did that. Even more interesting are the engravings found on cave walls. Now, the age of the marks hasn't been determined to a T. If they were created by Homo naledi, it would mean they would have a level of artistic expression and brain power that once again, we thought was unique to Homo sapiens. Now, to be fair, Homo naledi had uh, very small brains, so that's just not just us being arrogant. It makes sense that we always thought they were just kind of dumb apes. Next up, we have new revelations about the hunting practices of foraging society. So here's what we've always been taught in school, right? The men in ancient tribes would always be the ones out hunting while the women stayed home. And it turns out that may not be the case. Now, while it is true that men would have been hunting the majority of the time, there's recent evidence that points to women having hunted in about 80% of foraging societies around the world. And in a third of those societies, women were even taking down big game. So this particular finding started with a comprehensive review led by Carl Well Scheffler at the University of Washington, who delved deep into over 1,400 human societies societies worldwide, spanning over 150 years of studies. Now, as for why we haven't really heard much about this before, it seems there's just been a bit of a bias. The idea that men are the hunters and women stick to gathering has been so ingrained in our minds that it's just always how evidence has been interpreted. But now with this wealth of data, it's becoming more clear that women have been active participants in the hunt all along. What's also really fascinating is how flexible women's hunting strategies were. They weren't confined to one tool or method. They were using bows and arrows, knives, nets, spears, and in some cases, they were even hunting with their young strapped to their backs. Next up, we have a discovery made in 2023 of a very old Viking burial, really changing our understanding of Scandinavian history. So this mound, known as Harlog Shagen, was believed to be a typical Viking Age burial site. But turns out there's more to it than that. Surveys of the mound uncovered large rivets, which confirmed that this was the site of a ship burial. Now, that's not surprising on its own. Cool, but not surprising. This is Scandinavia, after all. What is surprising, though, is the date. 
It was dated to around 700 AD, which predates the Viking Age by several decades. This makes Harlaschagen the oldest known ship burial in Scandinavia, and it means that the tradition of burying people in large ships began much earlier than historians once thought. It also shows that the maritime skills and technology of the region were more advanced than we thought before as well, even before the Viking Age. Next on the list we have the Diary of Mirror. It used to be a pretty common belief that the Great Pyramids were built by slaves, being yelled at and whipped as they uncomfortably hauled massive mounds of limestone, but this version of events may not be accurate, and it all changed with the discovery of the Diary of Mirror, an ancient papyrus with details about how the ancient Egyptians built these structures and the lives of the workers who built them. Mirror was an official who oversaw a team responsible for transporting limestone blocks from quarries to the construction site of the Great Pyramid of Giza. His diary, dated to around 4,500 years ago, had all these meticulous details of the daily operations involved in this construction. What's surprising is that Mirror's diary mentions the workers being well fed and cared for, contradicting that image we have of brutal slavery often thought to be the case. Instead of slaves, it looks like the builders were skilled laborers and may have actually been compensated for their work. So uh, there you go. Now you can rest easy at night knowing one of the seven wonders of the world was built in an ethical way. Unless he was just lying in all those writings to make it all look better for like people discovering it in the future, you know? News of this next archaeological breakthrough was just released in 2023, and for those of you not keeping track of time, that's last year. So human fossils were found in the Tam Pa Ling cave in Laos that may change researchers' understanding of human migration into Australia. These fossils were found buried deep in the cave's sediment layers, giving us very important evidence that links the journey of early humans from Africa through South East Asia and eventually into Australia. The common belief has always been that human migration happened mostly through sea routes, but these human remains were found in a cave 186 miles inland in 2009, so that had scientists second guessing things. Using luminescence dating techniques, researchers were able to figure out a timeline, revealing the oldest fossils could have been between 68 and 86,000 years old, which pushes back the estimated arrival of humans in Southeast Asia by quite a bit. The findings could also mean that modern humans likely traveled through forested areas, possibly following river valleys on their journey from Africa to Asia and eventually to Australia. Were all the high-ranking members of society in ancient Europe always men? History has always taught us that was the case, but it turns out that Bronze Age Spain may have had women in powerful positions. Back in 2021, a pretty cool discovery was made in Spain. The discovery was of a woman's remains, and it looked like she'd been a ruling elite. Located beneath a Bronze Age ruin at a site in Murcia, Spain, the woman had been buried along with valuable objects, like a rare silver crown. There were also the remains of a man buried along with her, and uh, he didn't have anything cool on him. He was just a bunch of bones. This this ruin was also found to have possibly been the earliest palace discovered in Western Europe from the Bronze Age. The crown wasn't the only evidence that this woman had been in a position of power. It was also the location of her burial. She'd been beneath a room with a large building complex that looked to have been both residential and political. Basically, the place could have been a palace. Next on the list, we have the bronze statues. So in 2022, statues dating back 2300 years were discovered, and they were unlike anything seen before in Italy or even the Mediterranean. Led by archaeologist Jacob Taboli, the excavation team found 24 beautifully preserved bronze statues, including figures of gods like Hygieia and Apollo. They were also adorned with inscriptions honoring important Etruscan families. It looked as if the statues might might have been submerged in the thermal waters as part of some religious ceremony, which helped keep them in such fantastic condition over the centuries that people of that time had been praying together and honoring their gods in these ancient baths. Now, what was fascinating about this discovery is that it looks like the Etruscans and Romans may have been closer than what we once thought. Next on the list, we have the possible discovery, heavy emphasis on possible, 
the possible discovery of Amelia Earhart's plane. So you probably heard about this in the news about a month back. People are pretty excited about this one, and if it does turn out that Amelia Earhart's plane has been found, this will put an end to a decades-old mystery. A man named Tony Romeo, the CEO of Deep Sea Vision, led a team to the Pacific Ocean, close to Howland Island, where they captured sonar images using an underwater drone. They scanned 5,200 square miles of the ocean floor, and they captured what looks to be an aircraft looking similar to Amelia Earhart's Lockheed 10E Electra. Now, some say the wings, or what look like wings in the sonar image, look different than Earhart's plane. They're kind of like backward. And sure, there's totally a chance this is a different aircraft, but the wings could have also been damaged, and that's why they look to be bent back like that. At this point, we really don't know, but there's going to be an expedition later this year to see if this really is her plane. So we just gotta hold out for a little while. And we're finishing off today's list with a pretty incredible discovery made in Brazil. It all started in 2019 when a team of archaeologists were called in to inspect what seemed like a routine construction project at an apartment complex. But as they dug deeper, they stumbled on human bones along with this trove of ancient relics. And it all dated back thousands of years, some as far as 9,000. And there were over 100,000 artifacts in total along with 43 human skeletons. And what was also really interesting is that these findings spanned layers of history. Each layer was a different civilization that once lived in the region. About six and a half feet below the surface, archaeologists discovered remnants of a group that existed around eight to 9,000 years ago. And this was incredibly interesting because it pushed back the timeline of humans settling in Brazil by quite a bit. The team's been working for four years at the site, and this finding could rewrite history, changing what anthropologists used to believe about when humans migrated into the Americas from Asia. Starting off, we have the landing. Japan became the fifth country in history to reach the moon when one of its spacecrafts without astronauts successfully made a soft landing on the lunar surface early last week. However, space officials said they need more time to analyze whether the smart lander for investigating moon, aka SLIM, achieved its mission priority of making a pinpoint landing. SLIM landed on the moon at about 1220 a.m. Tokyo time, and there was a tense wait for news after the Japanese Aerospace Exploration Agency's mission control initially said that SLIM was on the lunar surface, but that it was still checking its status. Now, no further details were given until a news conference nearly two hours later, but even now, it's kind of hard to find information about the landing. I mean, what are they hiding from us? I need to know. The space officials believe the slim small rovers were launched as planned and that the data was being transmitted back to Earth, said Hitoshi Kaninaka, head of the Institute of Space and Astronautical Science, a unit of Japan's space agency. Now up next, we have moon rocks. It has been found that the oldest moon rocks are older than the oldest Earth rocks. The oldest moon rock returned to Earth is an anothorsite that was found by the Apollo 16 astronauts. It's estimated to be around 4.46 billion years old. Now that is just insane. Now this date corresponds to the formation of a larger lunar impact basin from which the rock was thrown. Other studies indicate that the rock lay exposed on the lunar surface for 8.6 million years after it was moved again by the formation of a nearby crater known as Spook Crater. Again, it is an anothorsite, the rock that makes up the light-colored lunar highlight. Now, the oldest rocks found on Earth are about 4.28 billion years old. Now, ancient rocks are rare on Earth because of active geologic forces, including plate tectonics and erosion, recycling, and removing the oldest surfaces. But with not that many people on the moon and messing with them, it's easier to find them there than on Earth. Now, it's just crazy to me that these rocks are that old. Moving on to the weird substance. The discovery was made by a U-2-2 drive team member in July 2019 during lunar day 8 of the rover's mission, which was a part of China's Change 4 mission to explore the far side of the moon. They discovered an object in the middle of a small crater that was initially described by Our Space, a Chinese language science outreach channel, which could be translated as gel-like. So yes, there was a gel-like substance found on the moon. Now, 
Outside scientists suspected the substance was glassy material created by impact that turned out to be correct. In their article Earth and Planetary Science Letters, Gu Sheng and colleagues analyzed data from U22's panoramic and hazard avoidance cameras and the rover's visible and near infrared spectrometer VNIS instrument. They use a procedure called spectral unmixing to break down the measured spectra from VNIS to determine the likely composition and abundance of the material. Now the authors describe the material as a dark greenish and glycerin impact melt bacteria measuring 20 inches by 6 inches. Now these features are signs of possible presence of glasses which are usually sourced from impact melts or from volcanic eruptions. Now let's discuss new elements found. The Indian Space Research Organization ISRO has made a landmark discovery on the moon's south pole using its Pragyan moon rover. A bunch of elements including sulfur, iron, calcium, manganese, oxygen, titanium, aluminum, corium, and silicon were identified. Notably, the absence of hydrogen raises questions regarding the presence of water ice in the area, a discovery scientists eagerly anticipate. Now, This achievement by Pragyan represents the first in situ measurements of these elements at the lunar location. Although the south pole was previously recognized for its large water ice deposits, this new data reshapes our understanding of it. Now, To identify these elements, the rover employed laser induced breakdown spectroscopy LIBS, a technique that implies intense heat to rocks, converting them to plasma which is then analyzed. Now we have secret moon layers. A groundbreaking discovery has been found on the moon, as recent research has found evidence of hardened lava layers just 300 feet beneath the moon's dusty and cratered surface, hinting at volcanic activities from a very long time ago. While the findings are yet to be definitively confirmed, the Change 4's lunar rover's low frequency ground penetrating radar has been instrumental. The rover, under the leadership of astrophysicist Yang King Fen from the Planetary Science Institute of Arizona, has detected differences in subsurface materials. Now, this has led researchers to theorize that the moon experienced lava flows for a billion years longer than previously believed. The densest volcanic material deep below the surface is much wider compared to the shallower volcanic layers, suggesting a gradual reduction of volcanic activity over time. Now, The most extensive layers measured about 230 feet across, whereas the shallow ones span only 5 meters. Now, This tapering off of volcanic activity is indicative of the moon's diminishing internal thermal energy. Now, Over time, the eruptions would have become progressively smaller until they ceased entirely. Current data points to three or four significant lava flow events in the von Karman's crater alone. Now, An ongoing investigation holds significant promise though, as if validated, it may reshape our understanding of the moon's geologic history, hinting at a more dynamic past with lava-filled landscapes opposed to the kind of boring, dusty moon we see today. Now, Did you know that there's water on the moon? Scientists say they have discovered water trapped inside tiny beads of glass scattered across the moon, suggesting a potential reservoir of this precious resource for future human activities on the lunar surface. The moon was long believed to be dry, but over the past few decades, several missions have shown that there is water both on the surface and trapped inside minerals. In 2023, scientists said that an analysis of lunar soil samples retrieved in 2020 during China's Robotic Changes 5 mission showed that these spheres of glass Glass, rock melted and cooled, bore within them water molecules formed through the action of the solar wind on the moon's surface. Now, the moon lacks bodies of liquid water, but its surface is thought to harbor a fairly substantial amount of water, for example, in ice patches residing in permanently shadowed locales and trapped in minerals. Researchers see promise in obtaining the water from the glass beads, perhaps through a heating process to release vapor that would then turn into liquid through condensation. Now, about 3.8 pounds of soil were collected in the Changes 5 mission, with 32 glass beads tens to hundreds of micrometers wide were examined in the study from the small amount of soil made available for this research. Now, I'm not gonna lie, this is pretty cool if you ask me. Our next topic is moon crystals. A rare lunar crystal found on the near side of the moon is giving scientists hope of providing limitless power for the world. Yeah, this sounds like something out of a cartoon, but it's it's real. The lunar crystal is made of material previously unknown to the scientific community and contains a key ingredient for the nuclear fusion process, a form of power generation that harnesses the same forces that fuel the sun and other stars in the galaxy. The crystal
crystal was found in the lunar basalt particles collected from the moon in 2020 and makes China the third country to discover a new lunar material behind the US and the former Soviet Union. The Chinese moon mission landed in December 2020 and was the first lunar sample return mission since the 1970s. Now, lunar samples were collected and delivered safely to Earth, and the crystal itself is transparent and roughly the width of a single human hair. It formed in a region of the moon that was volcanically active around 1.2 billion years ago. Now, one of the primary ingredients found in this crystal is helium 3, which scientists believe may provide a stable fuel source for nuclear fusion reactors. Now, the element is incredibly rare on Earth, but it seems to be fairly prevalent on the moon. China's next mission is expected to be Changes 6 in 2024, which will attempt to collect the first samples from the far side of the moon, which never faces Earth. Now, we have the early history of the moon. The moon is ancient and still preserves its early history, aka the first billion years. The extensive record of impact craters on the moon, when calibrated using absolute ages of lunar rock samples, provides a key for unraveling timescales for the geologic evolution of Mercury, Venus, and Mars based on their individual crater records. Remote sensing of other planets or the interpretation of geologic features via images and other data is based in part on lessons learned from the moon. Now, Before Apollo, for example, the origin of lunar impact craters were not fully understood, and the origin of similar craters on Earth was highly debated. Next up, the moon is lifeless. The Apollo program was a super important moment in human history. For example, the program was responsible for landing the first human beings on the surface of the moon. However, the Apollo missions contributed much more than putting humans on the moon. It also produced a lot of new scientific data and discoveries, which expanded our knowledge of both the moon itself and our solar system. If you didn't know, the moon is lifeless. Well, unless there's astronauts on it. It contains no living organisms, fossils, or native organic compounds. Extensive testing revealed no evidence for life, past or present, among lunar samples. Even non-biological organic compounds are amazingly absent, and traces can be attributed to the contamination by meteorites. And last on our list is the origin of the moon. Unlike other recent robotic missions aiming for the moon's south pole, Japan's spacecraft SLIM is targeting a site near a small lunar impact crater called Sholi, with a plane known as the Sea of Nectar that scientists suspect was formed by ancient volcanic activity. There, it will investigate the composition of rocks that may help scientists uncover the origins of the moon. A closer look at such minerals could reveal information about the moon's interior structure and formation. However, sites of the crater ejecta are usually avoided due to the difficulty of landing within a small ejecta strewn area on the slope side surrounding a crater. Now, the SLIM probe has a vision based navigation technology, and the spacecraft will capture photographs of the moon's surface as it approaches and rapidly pinpoint the vehicle's location on maps previously sketched out by lunar satellites, adjusting its trajectory as it swoops in for its landing. If you enjoyed this video about strange discoveries, then you have to check out this video next. It's about disturbing and creepy small towns around the world that you won't find on any maps. Click the video now to find out more.